Okay, so we're just at the hour here, and why don't we get started? Um, my name is Joseph Coniglio, and I'm the director of Antitrust Innovation Policy, as well as the Schumpeter Project on Competition Policy, here at the Information Technology Innovation Foundation. On behalf of ITIF, I want to welcome everyone to this uh, really special panel we have, uh, the DOJ FTC 2023 Merger Guidelines, Evolution or Revolution? Uh, just as a very brief background, uh, before the holidays, the DOJ and FTC published their anticipated uh, new merger guidelines following a period of very robust and, if I may say, often quite critical uh, public comments in response to their initial draft that uh, put uh, their vision forward for a neo-brand ICN approach to merger enforcement. Uh, without question, the, the guidelines are a pivotal part of the Biden administration strategy to repeal uh, what they believe was a 40-year failed antitrust experiment in law and economics which uh, for many uh, modern merger enforcement, uh, you know, is one of the exemplars. So uh, to discuss what's in the guidelines and their implications, I'm honored to have with me a very, very distinguished panel of experts that really need uh, no introduction. So I'm going to be very brief. Uh, first, Bruce Kobayashi, professor and PhD and Henry N. Butler chair in law and economics at uh, Anthony Scalia Law School at George Mason University, teaches and publishes widely in antitrust IP. Uh, Bruce served for many years as an economist, both at FTC and DOJ, most recently uh, as in the last administration as director of the FTC's Bureau of Economics, where he worked on the uh, 2020 vertical merger guidelines. So, so welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, second, uh, we have Diana Moss, uh, Vice President, Director of Competition Policy at the Progressive Policy Institute. Uh, prior to joining PPI, Diana, Diana was longtime president of the American uh, Antitrust Institute the first and uh, certainly leading uh, uh, antitrust reform think tank in Washington, and also served as an economist at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. She's spoken and published widely in all areas of antitrust competition policy. It's also an adjunct faculty in the Department of Economics at the University of Colorado Boulder. So uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, third, uh, Tim Muris, Foundation Professor of Law at the Annan Scalia Law School at George Mason, and uh, a senior counsel at Sidley Austin LLP where in uh, full disclosure, he was my former boss. Uh, but uh, more importantly, Tim was chair of the FTC from 2000 to 2004 and has the distinction of being the only person who directed both of the FTC's enforcement arms, uh, BC and BCP. Um, his distinguished career includes a number of other positions in government, a uh, long career in private practice, as well as many books, monographs, articles, and publications. Good to see you, Tim. Uh, finally, Carl Shapiro, uh, distinguished professor of the Graduate School at the Haas School of Business and Department of Economics, University of California, Berkeley. I think it's fair to say Carl's one of the leading IO economists in the world, uh, was a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and I also think has a unique distinction of serving as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for an economics at DOJ twice um, during one stint, played a key role with the uh, 2010 uh, Horizontal Merger Guidelines, which we'll be discussing, I'm sure. He also has a voluminous body of scholarship across antitrust, I.O., innovation, and much more. Uh, thank you, Coral. So uh, welcome again to all of our panelists, and uh, let's get right into it here. So, um, Diana, I want to begin with you and lay the foundation a little bit and ask what the uh, what the broader rationale was for these guidelines. Um, you know, in the press release that was issued with the draft, we got sort of three goals, uh, which I'll paraphrase briefly, you know, more in tune with the law better accessibility, including for the public, and um, sort of an up to, to uh, modern economics, especially around network and platform industries. Uh, what's the context here? Sure, thanks so much for having me. Um, and uh, good to see all my colleagues uh, online here. It's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, why new merger guidelines? Well, these are the seventh revision in 55 years. It's been 14 years since we had the 2010 guidelines. A lot has happened in that period of time. Um, certainly anyone from maybe the center right to the far left of the ideological spectrum would admit to uh, any degree of concern over uh, declining competition. Um, and, you know, we see that evidence. It's, it's hard to deny, you know, there are a number of dominant firms operating in U.S. markets. We have tight oligopolies in U.S. markets in healthcare, food and agriculture. Uh, we also have bottleneck supply chains where we have, um, uh, very concentrated markets in, in say, food processing, for example, food manufacturing. And, and that creates some interesting dynamics uh, that spur incentives uh, for mergers. Um, so, yeah, 
concern over under enforcement and whether that's just simply forbearance from uh, enforcing the antitrust laws, uh, whether it's failed remedies, uh, which I think is an enormous component, um, cite Safeway Albertson, cite Hertz Dollar Thrifty, whether it's just case selection, which cases to choose or not, uh, or high standards of proof in the courts, which have been really problematic um, uh, to date. So the question for the neo-Brandeisians was how to operationalize the, the ideology, right? Um, interestingly, the guidelines do not contain reference to who they serve. There is, there is not that magic phrase from the 2010 guidelines on how the guidelines serve the courts, practitioners, the business community, the public. That is not there anymore. It was in the draft, but it didn't make it into the final. The neobies we know to be focused on centralized economic power and how that translates uh, into competition, into inequality, wealth and income inequality, wage inequality. Um, we also know the neo-Brandeisians to focus on a very narrow interpretation of the consumer welfare standard. Um, I would argue that's an inaccurate uh, narrow interpretation. Uh, the consumer welfare standard is actually quite broad, but has been interpreted to really focus only on short-term, very static price effects. I think that has been a major flaw in, uh, in how the pathways uh, towards new guidelines have been carved out. Um, so, you, you know, the, 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 the bright line tests or quasi bright line tests are the favored tool for addressing mergers uh, moving forward. And, you know, very little focus originally in the draft guidelines on effects based analysis. We didn't hear that, that important explanation of how mergers can uh, enhance uh, market power, how uh, market power is exercised in a theory of harm, and most importantly, what are the impacts of the exercise of market power on consumers, workers, smaller businesses. So we, we didn't see any of this in the draft guidelines. And they did actually attempt bright line tests. And um, it was a weird tension. They were, they were quasi bright line tests, but all the economics was sort of relegated to the back of the document. We didn't hear much on effects-based analysis. Um, and so there, there appeared, at least to me, to be a backroom struggle between lawyers and economists and how these, how these guidelines were, uh, were promulgated. I would also note that the structure of the guidelines, uh, you know, the frameworks guidelines, the applications guidelines, you know, that's not all new stuff. Most of that was contained in the 2010 guidelines. There is some new stuff, the entrenchment guideline, there are the uh, applications guidelines on, on multi-sided markets and platforms, serial mergers, trends towards concentrations. But this is, this is not all new stuff. A lot of this has been repackaged and expanded on uh, in, these, in these guidelines. But we're still left with a really uncomfortable tension, um, a focus on quasi bright line tests, uh, legal precedent, which by the way, favors pre-1980s law and ignores a lot of the strong enforcement that came out of the Obama era. Um, we have all that, but we have, uh, we have economics being uh, taking a, a bit of a back seat uh, to legal doctrine, uh, but, but also have a greatly expanded discussion of economic methods and, uh, and analysis and evidence in the guidelines. So bottom line, uh, there was a large ideological overcorrection in the draft guidelines, if you read them carefully and you see where the final guidelines came out, there was definitely a pull back towards the center in many regards, but we are still left, I think, with some fundamental questions about how the courts will interpret them and how it will affect uh, cases as they come out of the courts. Great, well, thank you, Diana. I think that's a very, very helpful overview. And um, Carl, I wanna to turn to you next to get your thoughts. Um, I know also Diana mentioned the concentration issue and whether again, merger enforcement, you know, uh, could have been better. I know that's something you've written about. So uh, turn it to you. Well, I think these guidelines, like any merger guidelines are a function of the political context we find ourselves in, as well as the policy of learning and evolution. On the political side, Look, the Biden administration has fully embraced this neo-Brandeisian view with the uh, narrative that there's been, as, as you said, 40 years of failure or dramatic failure of antitrust. I don't think that's supported by the evidence. I don't think that's true, but that's what the president has said. That's Biden official policy. And so it, we see a document that's written as an advocacy piece and as a uh, aspirational, the way the neo-Brandeisian would like to see things work. 
That's very different than what we did in 2010 when I was very much involved in that at the DOJ, where it was a lot more, uh, while we were definitely pushing for stronger merger enforcement horizontal, was written to have credibility. And so we would say things like, well, mergers often create efficiencies and do good things, but we need to do X, Y, Z. There's none of those statements, kind of balancing statements. It, it's a very much an advocacy piece, and that's driven by the politics. On the other hand, the policy, it's its certainly time for an update. It, 13 years is, is a kind of probably about average for these updates. Uh, I wrote a paper two years ago now with Nancy Rose. These are all on my website, it, identifying a number of things that could be done. And they did a number of these platform markets. You know, something needed to be said about platforms you know, and tech, tech platforms. There's been a lot of talk about labor markets. I don't see it actually turning much into enforcement action, but they added, we we added actually uh, mergers between competing buyers and they expanded that in 2000 in the, to, to, to cover labor. So those are good things and we didn't do enough on potential competition. So there's a bunch of new areas there, but it's all within the context of this political imperative to take a, a sort of extreme positions and, and follow the rhetoric. That leads to what is basically a schizophrenic document. So let me mention a number of dimensions along with schizophrenic. Uh, that is that neo Brandeisian rhetoric, but you got the reality uh, of the markets and uh, case law and how, how merger enforcement actually works. So the neo Brandeisians really want to emphasize market structure, like it's really very structuralist. And yet, there's, there's a lot we all know. You really have to talk about economic effects if you're going to figure out what's going on in modern markets. The neo-Brandeisians want to say there's no efficiency defense, and we see some of that. But in fact, a merger analysis has to be a balancing of efficiencies versus harms. And so they got that. The labor market push, like I said, I actually welcome. On the other hand, where are the cases? And are there, is this really a place to spend a lot of resources for merger enforcement? They want to stop big firms from growing, but often big firms, by expanding into other areas, add competition. So we got all these tensions. And perhaps my final tension would be they want to cite all this, they cite all this very old case law from the Supreme Court, and I hope the lawyers on the call will address this. And yet they say they're doing this to reflect the reality of the modern economy. Well, this is a bit of a tension. Thanks, Carl. I'm going to just ask folks to mute if they're not talking, get a little bit of feedback here. But uh, Bruce, I want to turn it over to you and maybe, uh, you know, get your thoughts and explore perhaps one of those tensions between sort of updating the guidelines to discuss the modern economy and uh, also the public accessibility point. Um, you know, there was some talk from the Neo-Brandeisians about keeping things simple and administrable. Uh, there sure is a lot of economics and uh, quite detailed and technical stuff in these new guidelines. So perhaps you might touch on that. Well, I, I, I think that um, you, know, you, you have had economics sort of get ingrained into, into this particular area of law. And uh, I think that um, the, the tension really is that uh, I think for the economists for decades, uh, from the first time I was at the agencies to, to, till my recent service, really have a uh, view that their job is to uh, try and distinguish between pro and anti-competitive conduct, uh, and you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think that Diana said that, you know, that they want to do simple rules, and, and simple rules in an error cost analysis are are, are completely uh, legitimate if, in fact, you could show that you know the the vast majority of the transactions, or or if you're doing conduct. Uh, actually, are, um, fit the 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 right outcome. Um, I I think the the big problem here is that the simple rules, uh, especially the the structure based ones, are uh, not supported by any evidence. I mean, economists sort of rejected sort of structural approach to uh, antitrust uh, in, in the in the seventies and. Uh, uh, Nobody's returned to them. Uh, the the evidence that for uh, uh, um, increased concentration is very weak, and, and so I think what what Carl said about the the schizophrenia is that 
Yeah, I, I think what what the the leadership of the agencies wanted to do was to put in these simple structural rules and uh, it, the the forty year history, which Joe Biden had said was a failed experiment, really went to a more sophisticated uh, um, economic approach, which uh, uh, attempted to try and discern or or, or differentiate between pro and anti competitive. Uh, transactions uh, based on economic analysis. So I, I think that you know they they put in a lot of the economics that took it out of the appendix, uh, um, you know, be, because of the realities of of what uh, merger analysis is and uh, has been for, for for decades in the antitrust uh, um, enforcement area. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Tim, want to make sure we get your thoughts on the big picture too. And um, you know, I'll note a speech you gave in 2002 um, on on merger guidelines. You noted another sort of core goal, which was having limited limiting principles. Uh, uh, how do these do generally, and perhaps also in that respect? Tim, you're on mute. Make sure you unmute. Uh, that's yes. I I followed your earlier instructions. I apologize. Uh, I want to thank ITIF and uh, fellow panelists, and uh, and and also the the caveat that uh, these views are my own and not not the two people that uh, that 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 pay me the the Virginia and the Sidley law firm. Uh, look, I want to I I agree uh, with uh, uh, with the, with the previous comments, especially about the about the schizophrenia, which I think everyone is. Uh, but I want to put this in a somewhat different and bigger context, the context of, of two of my former hats. One is, a, one is an enforcer and the other, I don't, I don't do much merger work now, but, but uh, uh, as an advisor and working on, on mergers from the other side. Uh, and, and the place a place to begin in that context is the FTCs, and I pay a lot more attention to the FTC, but uh, because it's a little more outspoken than DOJ, but you can get some of this out of the DOJ leaders. The FTC's outspoken ho hostility to, to, to business uh, in general and mergers in particular. And, and, and let me give you one of the most striking examples uh, in seemingly innocuous in the FTC strategic plan. The FTC for years had said, quote, it would enforce its laws without unduly burdening legitimate business activity. Now, that seems unassailable, and the F yet the FTC deleted it. Again, they were not willing to say that they would enforce their laws, quote, without unduly burdening legitimate business activity. Uh, no explanation was given, uh, but it was clear the, the hostility. Uh, to business and the big business. Uh, if, if you look at the context, the overall context in mergers, I think it reflects what, what Terry Calvani, a former FTC commissioner, uh, called uh, uh, an attitude about raising the cost of mergers. And if you raise the cost of something, you're going to decrease its supply. Scott Barche, who was, uh, who's a, a, you know, the leading corporate guy in one of the biggest law firms, uh, he's found, uh, uh, he's a deal guy, uh, and what he's found from the agencies is, it's, is an interorum campaign to create uncertainty and delay, and that's resolved in fewer deals. Now, there are multiple ways to increase delay. I'll come back to these guidelines in just a second, but the, the, the administration's been experimenting in all of them. Uh, they've abandoned early termination. Uh, they expanded the scope of second requests. Uh, the, the warning letters, the increasing administrative litigation, they've avoided settlements except beyond the last, the last minute, like in the, in, in the Amgen Horizon deal. And now they propose the, the absolute uh, Sistine Chapel of the art, which is to increase filing requirements on all mergers, even uh, the overwhelming majority in which there's no uh, 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 antitrust issue. Now, the guidelines are part of this hostility uh, and especially problematic to the extent they do not reflect modern merger law. 
And I believe that's true in, in several areas. I'll list a few, and I'm sure we'll discuss them as we go along, but let me list, <coughs> uh, let me list prominent ones. Uh, first is moving the thresholds. Uh, and, and second are, are the non-horizontal mergers. The point is not to end if someone wants to go through the costs and the delay, and delay is the biggest cost, quite, quite frankly. The uncertainty that's caused in, by businesses <coughs> in, the, in, in that delay deters mergers. Uh, but by raising those costs, I believe uh, that, that the people running the agencies know and are counting on the mere threat of delay and enforcement uh, will deter mergers regardless of whether they're aspirational, I think that was, that was Carl's word and a good one, whether their aspirational view of the law uh, uh, will be implemented. And indeed, they've taken none of the steps that people have taken in the past, such as when I was FTC chairman, to lay the groundwork for legal reform. One of the best examples is what we did with hospital mergers. Uh, but I think in, in the context of, of, of a strategy that's anti-merger, there's parts of these guidelines that fit very well into that strategy. Well, thanks, Tim. Um, I think that's uh, again very, very helpful. And let's let's get right into the concentration threshold uh, issue. So, Carl, did you want to start us off there and uh, maybe explain what's in these guidelines? And I mean, I know in your comment you mentioned maybe you were comfortable with some lowering of the thresholds, but again, there's some other parts that uh, may not be reflected in some of the case law. Maybe you can start us off here. Sure. So first, um, for everybody, the these the new guidelines. Uh, restore in part the, the, the concentration thresholds, which are measured through the Herfindahl Index, the HHI, to where they were in 92. In 2010, we had uh, raised the thresholds, that is to say, require a greater level or increase of concentration in order to trigger a presumption of anti-competitive harm. So um, when we did that, we said we were doing that just based on actual enforcement record so that the guidelines would be consistent with what we were actually doing. We briefed to that there had been a very big gap between what the guidelines said and what the agencies were doing. So one question looking forward is, will the agencies now do what they say, right? Will they start to enforce at the levels in the new, the new lower levels? Howard Jelansky and I did a study from 2010 to 2020, and uh, we well, 2000 to 2020, and we showed that the... Um, that the, Herf, the average Herfindahl, these are post-merger Herfindahl in the litigated cases, was 5,800, and the average change in the Herfindahl was nearly 2,000. So in fact, the enforcement is still way above the thresholds. So lowering them and not changing the actual enforcement will just create a bigger gap again between the guidelines and, and reality. Now, Tim has a theory about why that might be why I might doing that. The the um, so that's a question looking forward, and then we took the view you would need a lot more resources to enforce at this lower level. So that's a, first a question: Will they do it? Will they stand by the words? Because we didn't back off because we thought maybe that was necessarily great policy. It was just reality and good government to be accurate about what you're saying. So that's the first question. Let me then turn to my slide um, to show you what the what the ninety these are the ninety two thresholds. And I said they've gone back now to those in part. So on the horizontal axis is how much is what's the post-merger Herfindahl index. And the zones were between over 1,800 was kind of highly concentrated. In between 1,000 and 1,800 was moderately concentrated. And the vertical axis is how much the Herfindahl goes up. So it was the red zone, which was pres basically presumed to be harmful to competition. Yellow zone, which is could be we're going to look closely and green zone was unlikely to cause a problem okay so when i actually looked at this when we were working in 2010 i go how weird that the red and the green zones touch it doesn't make any sense to me you know there should be like a buffer yellow zone so we put it we made it there be the buffer what have they done now they've gone back to this so the red zone is here 
But what, and they, the guidelines, if you read what they say, they say, oh, we're just going back to where they were before based on experience, and that's a good thing to do. But they haven't actually done that because there is no green zone anymore. Okay, so this is a major change. And it's, again, I can link it to Tim's previous comments here. The, the, there's, there's no statement that if the concentration levels or changes are small, there's unlikely to be a problem and they're unlikely to challenge. Okay, now this relates to other things in the guidelines that I won't talk about right now, but that's very intentional, I believe, and strategic. So that's, that's, that's a real change from 92 or all previous guidelines, okay, which is unacknowledged, but worthy of note. The other thing they've done is added a whole different red zone based on the market share of the merging firm. If it's over 30%, and if the change in Herfindahl is more than 100, that is also, under these guidelines, presumed to harm competition. And they cite Philadelphia National Bank for that, the 1963 decision, I think, is the year. The odd thing about that is that Philadelphia National Bank does indeed say more than 30% is, or, you know, is, is, a, is a threshold for, for a presumption. But the change in Herfenthal in that case was 600 because there was abruptly a 15% and a 20% merger. So I don't know how they get the change of Herfenthal over 100 leading to a presumption with a 30% share out of Philadelphia National Bank because 100 is not close to 600. But that's what they say. Thanks, Carl. Um, Bruce, why don't we turn to you next and... Uh... Um, you know, also talk about uh, vertical mergers. I mean, you know, as we've already heard, these these guidelines combine combine the whole analysis into one. And uh, one thing that was in the draft uh, guidelines was this structural presumption, even for ver vertical mergers. And it seems like we don't have that here. But there is this footnote 30, which talks about the agencies um, you know, generally inferring, uh, you know, uh, that, that a merge firm will have a power for foreclosure analysis if they hit 50 percent. So where do we stand on vertical mergers in the structure question? Uh, well, uh, in, in contrast to the horizontal merger guidelines, which were, you know, the last in 2010, uh, the, the vertical merger guidelines were, were uh, from 2020. Uh, they actually started when I was there in, in 2019. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, the, the staff in the Bureau of Economics said we ought to do this is it's unlikely they get rid of them so soon. And so, uh, so much for our... Uh, our uh, powers of of of, of uh, prediction, but um, you know, one of the 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 things that that we tried to do in the 2020 vertical merger guidelines, which have been completely eliminated, was to sort of extend the the uh, the um, unilateral effects analysis uh, that had uh, been so uh, adopted uh, in horizontal mergers to vertical mergers. And um, you know, one of the, the the things about a vertical merger is that unlike a horizontal merger, you're combining vertical complements, and you have both uh, downward pricing pressure uh, uh, possible, and uh, along with uh, the upward pricing pressure if you engage in foreclosure. And all of these things were unilateral effects. And uh, one of the principles that we really wanted to put in was that. Uh, all the unilateral effects should be done together because they're all, you know, the, uh, uh, effects of the same kind. They're not efficiencies. They are, you know, incentives to, to uh, engage in uh, pricing. Uh, and the, the EDM part of it was that uh, if you have two vertical, uh, uh, two, two monopolists or, or, or two people with market power, uh, and they have comp vertical complements that they sell, they'll price too high and they make more money when they uh, lower the price. And that's what they'll do if they combine. Uh, it's not an efficiency. And, and the big uh, problem with making an efficiency, as, as I think we'll talk later, is that uh, it's just really difficult to not have those efficiencies dismissed. Uh, there was an Illumina Grail uh, actually, the, the Fifth Circuit said, no, the, the, the EDM is actually merger-specific, but it, 
it's it's not cognizable because they didn't prove that they'd actually lower price. Well, I mean, that's just silly because they will lower price because they make more money. Consumers also benefit, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you have that silliness. And what we really wanted to do was to sort of put all of the unilateral effects in, in together. Um, these guidelines basically, uh, I, they put in a, a footnote about EDM uh, um, and, uh, and basically say that, you know what, it's, it goes in with, with efficiencies, which probably means that, uh, uh, at least at the agency, they're, they're probably not going to credit it. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, th this is a step backwards. Uh, be, because it really does sort of not recognize the, the fundamental difference between the uh, horizontal and vertical mergers in that you're, you're combining complements. Thanks, Bruce. Um, and just a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, please do, please do submit those. I see we're about at the halfway mark. And, um, uh, you know, turning to Diana, um, I think one of the other differences between the draft um, and the, 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 the guidelines that were actually enacted not just the removal of the structural presumption, but this this general guideline for vertical cases, uh, but this general guideline on the trend toward concentration. Um, but we still have, I think, some relevance there in these current guidelines about trend towards concentration being an important factor in the analysis. So is this another level of structuralism that's sort of crept into the guidelines? How should we how should we re interpret the change and what we actually have? Sure. So, so there are two new guidelines that um, are um, are different, and 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 I call them the dynamic guidelines because they involve they involve uh, scrutiny of of a merger that falls within a certain pattern, whether it's increasing concentration in a market or whether it's a pattern as part of a serial acquisition. Um, I think the courts are going to struggle with this. Uh, the guidelines, and we were critical of this at PPI, did not, we asked in our comments, but did not see in the final version that, that they really explain how, what is the context for a dynamic uh, market situation, a trend or a serial acquisition? You know, how far back do we go? What are they looking for in terms of type, size, characteristics of acquisition? Um, you know, how will incrementalism uh, be counted or or empiricized. None of that was explained in the final guidelines. I really think the courts will struggle. I also would make this comment in the zeal or the zest for getting to a stronger horizontal presumption, there is zero mention of anything below a highly concentrated market. So that moderately concentrated uh, uh, level is, is gone. There is no reference to that anymore. Um, but that, had it stayed in, that would have been very, very useful and handy and, and almost essential for these new dynamic guidelines, a trend towards concentration, serial acquisitions, because a lot of those problems are likely to fall in markets where a merger increases concentration only uh, uh, by, by a moderate amount, or you have a moderate, con moderately concentrated mar market. But but that that uh, that reference is gone in the final guidelines. It's all highly concentrated now. And so I think we've taken away a really important benchmark or tool or metric for, uh, for the public, for practitioners, for the courts to use in assessing uh, what constitutes a problem under one of the trends, uh, the trends guideline or the serial concentration guideline. And one more quick comment on the verticals. I'm calling it a mega vertical guideline. It is by far the longest guideline uh, in terms of page page numbers in the entire document. It contains no less than 10 discrete subtopics layered in it and uh, is going to present um, uh, in, an incredible amount of complexity and, um, and digging for, uh, for the agencies and also for the courts. So I'm really curious as to how that's going to unpack when we see litigated cases. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Tim, I want to go to you next. Uh, we've already talked about the law here and as sort of the practicing lawyer um, on the panel. Um, how do these guidelines do with respect to their goal of, uh, you know, especially the structural, the concentration thresholds, um, you know, living up to not just the law in, a, as a whole, but even the early law, the old cases that the neo uh you know, say that they want us to remember. I mean, as Carl pointed out, you know, the, the 100 HHI, Delta HHI condition in the market share threshold. I mean, that's not in PNV. Um, are there any other mistakes uh, that we might uh, keep in mind? Let me make 
Uh, three points about the concentration thresholds. First, picking up on on Carl, uh, th this is really a, a a gigantic move. Putting the twenty five hundred to eighteen hundred in, and 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 then of course you've got this thirty percent gloss on 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 top of it. Uh, it, it 2,500 is, is four to three equally sized firms and 1,800 is six to five. That's, that's a big difference uh, where you're saying the marginal case uh, is an industry, is a merger from, is four to three in the one case and a merger is six to five in the other. And returning to, to, my, to my first set of comments, what that means is, and then again, picking up on Carl, what are they going to do? Well, presumably at a minimum, they're going to put you through the ringer uh, on, on your six to fives. Uh, and uh, parties, you know, I predict that there will be people deterred at least until they see uh, how serious the government is uh, uh, and uh, how how the situation plays out. I think there necessarily will the the goal of deterring mergers will will be successful. Uh, uh, but in the end, of course, it's a it's a it's a game that will be played in various iterations. So that's the the first comment. The second comment is to build on what Carl said again. And that is that the the twenty five hundred number, the four to three number, came out of when he said experience. The FTC's experience was public in uh, data releases. There were multiple data releases that I started, and they were based on a long data series of second requests. And it showed, and this was the population from the Clinton administration through early Obama. And it showed that the agency actually, in looking at, at this long population of second requests, found that, that the marginal merger was indeed four to three. It didn't mean they didn't challenge uh, 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 mergers with, 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 more, with more competitors. Uh, they did, but six to fives were, were rare outside of, outside of energy. Uh, it also didn't mean that they didn't let go mergers uh, uh, with fewer competitors. Although, quite frankly, they challenged more more mergers than, than, than you know that were that were not the marginal ones than they let go uh, the other ones. The final comment uh, it responds directly to your question, and I wrote in this in a long tome I did for the American Enterprise Institute about Neo Brandisi and antitrust. Chair Khan likes to say repeatedly that that the 40 years involved uh, a <clears throat> essentially abandonment of settled precedents. Well, that that's just simply wrong. Uh, and and one of the best ways to understand that is the court record of the Carter FTC in 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 general, but in merger cases in particular. In those days, they litigated a lot of cases. There were 22 such cases that were litigated into the Reagan administration, you know, before the before the results. These are cases filed uh, uh, starting in 1977. Uh, some Tim, I think we're having some technical difficulties here, um, but um, why don't we just uh, move, move to the next? Uh, topic well Tim you just gets pick up on. with the one thing that Tim said well maybe he'll come back footnote 15 in the guidelines says they changed the increased they lowered the thresholds based on experience and evidence developed since 2010 the agencies consider these lower ones up to quote better reflect both the law and the risks of competitive harm suggested by market structure so um I would really like to know what evidence they're referring to. I've been involved in a lot of cases over this period of time. I have not seen that type of evidence myself. Of course, if it's there, that's very persuasive. I'm a big supporter of the structural presumption, unlike Bruce, okay? I've written in favor of it. It's very important. It's how the government wins. I have a paper with her involving camp on this, but that doesn't answer the question of what level you should put the, the numbers at, both in terms of what, what we know about effects and agency resources. 
So there's a there's a very clear statement in here why they're doing it based on this evidence, and I'd like to see the evidence. Thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, can, can I can I follow up just really short? I I, I mean I. Uh, I think that you know at, at the Bureau of Economics, one of the things we did was retrospectives, and you know we had lots of, of uh, um, encouragement for for staff to do sort of retrospectives of non-challenged mergers. Uh, and uh, Dan Hoskin and, and Smith, uh, you know, they did a nice thing on grocery stores, and they said let's let's look at ones at the margins of the '92 guidelines and uh, above and below, and. Uh, you know, you 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 did have sort of some attempt at doing studies of mergers at the margin, but you know, they're they're it's hard to sort of uh, you know say that this context then gives you a general rule. Uh, you can't use Quoca because Quoca is published retrospective studies and and it's not a, a random or representative sample. There is a paper by Bhattacharya, Alanis, and Stillerman. It's an NBR paper. And they do retail, and they try to get the entire um, uh, uh, universe of of deals, uh, you know. Um, and you know, I, I think that's as close as you come to something that you know would be supportive of the statement that 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 Carl suggests. But really, I mean, you know, we we haven't done the. Uh, I have not seen the work, and I doubt it's been done to to sort of figure out, you know. Uh, to, to sort of give the evidence that you need to answer the question where the threshold should be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that work should be done. It would take a lot of resources, but uh, I, I don't think it's been done either. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I want to make sure we keep moving here so we get to the, uh, the defendant's case. Um, so, Tim, and I want to start with you here. Um, you know, we've talked about the structural presumption, the prima facie case. Um, on the uh, defendant side, you know, we have a section uh, rebuttal evidence where we have the entries, uh, entry uh, efficiencies, failing firm. But I, you know, I've heard from some practitioners, um, you know, just about uh, the extent to which they're going to include just other conduct evidence that could rebut uh, a structural case. So, you know, in a coordinated market, let's say you had concentrate uh, coordination that failed, or you know, uh, companies are not particularly close substitutes. To what extent do these guidelines sort of contemplate that sort of basic conduct evidence being used to uh, rebut a structural case if it doesn't fall into one of those three buckets? And you're on mute, uh, Tim. Well, my microphone says I'm not, but can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Look, let's let's take efficiencies for 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 example. Uh, the guidelines that, that, that they're this the schizophrenia that 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 we've talked about is is sort of obvious. The first sentence on efficiencies quotes Procter and Gamble, the often cited passage in Procter and Gamble uh, for the prop and that a, a, a sentence that's that's frequently cited for the proposition that there's no efficiency defense. But that sentence says, quote, possible economies cannot be used as a defense. Now, anyone who supports the defense, such as I do, agrees that that economies have to be more than possible. Uh, now, I, I, it's true that the neo-Brandesians are hardly known for such a punctilious literality. Uh, and uh, I, I doubt that they... Uh, 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 read that sentence, uh, which they led their discussion of efficiencies with, uh, uh, with, with the literal emphasis on the word possible. At the 2022 ABA spring meeting, the, the first Biden FTC director of the Bureau of Competition, uh, when asked, uh, she could not identify a single positive attribute about, about mergers. Now, it's important to understand and compare these guidelines with past guidelines when you're talking about any sort of of, of defenses. Uh, before the Biden administration, merger law was overwhelmingly uh, an administrative regulatory process with enforcement via consent agreements and, and litigation extremely rare. 
that administrative procedure was much more sophisticated than what happened in court. What happened in court was usually a battle over the government trying to to put the the merging parties within the structural presumption uh, in terms of market shares and the parties trying to stay outside the the structural presumption. So it was a fight over the market over the market definition. Uh, uh, in court efficiencies were treated by the government with hostility. Now, outside the agencies were more receptive to efficiencies. It doesn't mean that they were generally receptive, but but they would listen in the in those data releases I mentioned a few minutes ago. There were the odd cases where the government you, where, where you saw a a a four to three, a, a, even a three to two, on the, rarely where the government did not challenge because of efficiencies. A famous example, even before the data releases I was involved with was the, the General Motors Toyota joint venture 40 years ago, uh, about this time. Uh, and we, uh, it was very controversial, uh, the three to two vote, and we approved it in part because, a significant part because of efficiency. And one of the efficiencies was the, the, uh, demonstration, the ability of, of testing uh, the more efficient Japanese production methods with American unionized workers. Uh, and uh, 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 that was important. Uh, it turned out uh, in the event, it, it turned out to be a tactical success and a strategic failure. Uh, in other words, uh, 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 General Motors and Toyota succeeded at, at uh, the Toyota executives ran the, uh, uh, the merger. The American workers succeeded in using Japanese methods, but General Motors failed in, uh, in, in transferring that success to its workforce as a whole. But, but, you know, that was a prominent example and there are others over time. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Carl, I want to turn to you next on efficiencies and, um, you know, in particular, maybe mention, I think, what is a new criteria uh, in an efficiencies uh, defense, this idea of an efficiency not being anti-competitive um, in a way that may harm a trading, park, mar, par, trading partner in another market. Um, does that change the efficiency analysis um, at all? Well, let me start a little higher level, respond to what Tim said. Um, I agree with him. It's very schizophrenic. They start by saying efficiency is not a defense and then talk about what they'll listen to. People often, the fact is the agencies have long been hostile to efficiency defenses because they feel that there's a lot of people make all these claims and they're really hard to verify. And, you know, they're very skeptical, maybe hostile, skeptical. People ask me, do efficiencies ever matter? Including when I was at DOJ and I said, of course. Every deal that gets that goes through efficiencies were rot with a reason. If you didn't think there were any efficiencies, why would you let any mergers go through? Why wouldn't you just stop all mergers? Have a very simple rule. So the the attitude towards efficiencies, even apart from you know the difficult legal hurdles in court for the defense, matters a lot. And um, there's clearly a host uh, really the, the skepticism has gone towards hostility. I think. Um, uh, so that so now in terms of um, these anti-competitive effects, I don't think that's much of a change, Joe. As far as I know, I mean, it was always the case that if the efficiency was based on some, um, well, take a case where you what would they have in mind here? Now you've got a merger, you lower your input costs because you squeeze a supplier, a workers maybe, or an, another supplier. Okay. The question is, does that count? This came up in the health insurance mergers. It was a big thing during the Obama years, right? So I think the view is, it's always been, it counts if there's really a cost savings, a real efficiency, and it doesn't count if it's monopsony power, if you're just getting more power in the input market. And they say that. So I don't think that's much of a change. I think the other thing though, that is a big change, and this will echo what Bruce said earlier, is the vertical, the treatment of elimination of double marginalization it's really inconsistent to say that when you have two substitutes that merge, we're gonna there's gonna be these price increases throughout unilateral effects. So it's correct. There's a strong there's an incentive in that direction, and then deny that the same thing works with the opposite sign when you have two complements that are joined. 
that's just not logical as a matter of economics. Now, I still think the defense should have to prove these are merger specific, but it's a different category and very disappointing to me that um, that's not recognized, that basic economics in these guidelines. Diane, I want to make sure we get you in here on efficiencies as well and defenses. Sure. So just a, just a couple of quick comments. Um, I would agree with Carl. Uh, really, nothing's changed in terms of the standards that the agencies are going to hold efficiencies defenses to. It's merger specific. It's cognizable. Cannot uh, cannot result in uh, a lessening of of competition um, and not anti-competitive. So I, I mean, all of that has been very clear. I think in previous versions of the guidelines, um, I do think the guidelines really make uber clear, and this is a good thing, uh, that uh, uh, in the burden shifting process, defendants just come, can't come back and say, hey, you know, we're going to generate all these cost savings or all of these more dynamic benefits around more products, you know, more innovation, faster to market. They can't do it. They have to actually show that the efficiencies they generate are going to reduce their incentives to exercise market power. That is a really critical, critical um, uh, standard, I think that will will actually help the courts uh, that made it into this version um, of the guidelines. I will say this though, um, in the in the transformation from draft to final, every single frameworks guideline now contains the wording that it is a rebuttable it, that it can be rebutted with uh, the prima facie case can be rebutted with evidence of uh, of efficiencies that did not exist in the draft. That's why we call them quasi bright line tests. But now. They are in there. But here's what I find really um, puzzling and, and almost disturbing. In going the, the extra 100 miles to include legal precedent, uh, they missed a really golden opportunity to wrap in uh, economic learning and evidence and good empirics that's, that really support stronger enforcement on the efficiency side. Uh, Bruce talked about merger retrospectives. We, we may not all agree on what's a good retrospective, but come on, we've got a growing body of retrospectives that show adverse effects from previous mergers. Um, I did an analysis of the AT&T Time Warner merger. That deal was unwound in less than three years. No way, no how could any efficiencies really have been realized in that short a period of time. The, if they're gonna spill so much ink on legal precedent, why not provide the courts, the public, practitioners, the business community with some good solid narrative on what buttresses or supports um, arguments about efficiencies. And, and I mean in a skeptical way. I'm a, I'm a center lefter. And I think that evidence is out there that we should be very skeptical of efficiencies offenses. They rarely pan out. And um, the guidelines missed an opportunity to, to include that in this version. Thanks, Diana. Uh, Bruce, I want to turn to you. Um, uh, any comments on efficiencies, but also, you know, I see you've got about 10 minutes left here. Moving into um, probably what's going to be our last topic, which is any any new theories or resurrecting of old theories that are in these guidelines, uh, especially around conglomerate mergers and the entrenchment uh, extension point, if you could touch on those. And you're on mute, Bruce, Bruce so please uh, unmute. Guideline six uh, is about dominance. And I, I, I think dominant, we talked about the, the structural presumption, uh, but but dominance is a, a, a you know special role for large firms. And uh, the other part of guideline six is that it really is, I mean, they talk about nascent and I, I, I take that to be uh, um, just a, a tip of the hat to the limitations of e even the potential competition doctrine. But uh, um, they go on and they basically have a whole sort of mention of a bunch of section two conduct, uh, tying, bundling, and, and things like that. And, you know, what, once again, uh, the whole notion of dominance in large firms, you know, becoming large is, is endogenous, right? It, it, it could come from uh, potentially from engaging in a lot of foreclosure and in, and in competitive conduct or acquisitions, or it become, could become uh, come from you know being successful. Um, that that's the lesson that Harold Demsetz you know taught me when I was in graduate school, and um, you know I, I think the 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 basic problem is the same as as using concentration in horizontal mergers in in that. Uh, 
there, there really isn't any guidance. It, it really is that, you know, when you're a, a, a firm that we determine to be dominant uh, and that's not well uh, defined in these guidelines, then there are all these things. Uh, take bundling. Bundling is ubiquitous. Bundling could raise welfare. Bundling could engage, you know, have you engage in price discrimination. It could lower welfare. Uh, we've had the whole set of Supreme Court cases from Sylvania to Legion, which basically took all of that Section 2 conduct out of the per se rule into rule of reason, right? Because they're, it's hard to figure out ex ante, you know, what these things do. And, and the nice thing about doing them in Section 2, which you could still do, is that uh, the conduct occurs and you actually have some generation of economic evidence to see what their effect was. So, you know, this is a big change. Um, it, you know, when I, when I was uh, at the commission in, in 2018 and 2019, that the actually my last day there, uh, there was Illumina Pack Bio, and you look at uh, um, count one, and it was monopolization. And uh, that was based on nascent competition. Uh, but um, so these things are not sort of out of left field. Uh, but they are sort of uh, not actually defined uh, in it or cammed in in any way that I think it's going to be useful in terms of being a guideline. Um, Thanks, Bruce. Oh, sorry, we just want to no, make no, sure we. It's okay. I'll, I'll let other people go. Yeah, we got a question from the audience here that goes right into sort of the possibility and the sort of evidence that the uh, the agencies need to show here, sort of a general critique of the guidelines. But in particular, Tim, maybe you could talk about the potential competition. Uh, theories briefly, um, you know, obviously your opinion in Genzyme, Novozyme on the innovation question, sort of a, I guess, a guidepost for, for enforcement. Um, did you see anything on potential competition that sort of suggested an expansion in that area? Well, look, I, I you know, re, re, looking at their attitude on potential competition, uh, I, I, I sat when I was uh, in my mid 20s, on the FTC's merger screening committee in the pre Hart Scott Rodino days, and it, it was it was the goal of of the most of the bureau competition merger lawyers was to expand potential competition law. That was the main the, it meet every two weeks, and and that was one of their main goals that we contributed to that poor court record that I mentioned uh, 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 a half hour ago or so, and. And it's like uh, I've been uh, uh, the that attitude uh, has returned in spades, and you saw it uh, in the in the two cases the FTC lost. The Amgen Horizon case was uh, which, uh, which uh, some of the theories to which uh, Bruce was alluding uh, was uh, 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 an an extreme uh, version of. Of, of some of the aggressive theories. I know it, it led the original Arita Turner uh, treatise uh, to take a very hostile view toward, uh, uh, toward potential competition theories on the ground that it was, uh, uh, it, it was very hard to draw meaningful standards that judges could apply. And I don't think these guidelines have moved us uh, very far down that road, uh, but I, I'll shut up since we're almost out of time and let the others comment. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Carl, Diane, anything before we end on sort of uh, maybe resurrecting old theories in these guidelines, potential competition, conglomerate? Um, and also, Carl, I know you mentioned labor. There's a lot more there. Maybe that's a newer theory, too. Um, any final thoughts? Well, let me pick up on potential competition because I don't think we did enough in 2010 on that. I mean, we brought it in, actually, and mentioned it, but not much. So I really welcome that and encourage that. Um, I think one of the framings of the new guidelines, they talk about how mergers can create a risk of harm to competition. You know, the statute says may substantially lessen competition. So I think emphasizing that these things are uncertain, we don't know for sure, is a helpful general framing, and that can help specifically with potential competition cases. Um, but um, it's definitely not new, okay? And it is aspirational again, I'm also big on emphasizing the firm's incentives and capabilities to enter rather than looking necessarily for specific plans to do so, which is a very hard evidentiary hurdle for the government to clear. On the other hand, if a company considered and rejected entering on their own, 
the guidelines say, well, that that still indicates they can, and and maybe they will. I, I don't quite see that. That seems <clears throat> a little bit much. <clears throat> Nor do they recognize that entry by toehold or acquisition often can be highly pro-competitive. And it's that sort of missing statement that that bugs me a bit. Um, it's again, it's the rhetoric. They don't want to give anything there to the other side in order to build credibility. That's how these guidelines are written. Diana? Sure, just a, a really quick, um, maybe sum up comment based on what we've heard so far on the, on the guidelines and how they're structured. I think it's really important to note that there are two types of guidelines in this document. There are applications guidelines and there are frameworks guidelines. The frameworks guidelines are really the theories of harm. And the applications guidelines are the new kind of guidelines that they have that they decided to codify. They are how they are certain settings or contexts in which the theories of harm may be applied. Um, I, I think it's fair to say the frameworks guidelines are pretty exhaustive. You know, they're they're uh, they're from what we've seen in the past in the 2010s. We've added the entrenchment guideline. Great. The applications guidelines are another animal entirely. They are not exhaustive, and we raise this in our comments that look, you have you have a bunch of selected settings here. Uh, but it's not a complete list. You know, what happened to a setting where you have mergers that are creating vertically integrated systems and then uh, we're really now becoming more concerned about inter-system competition? That's not in there. What about digital business ecosystems that grow through uh, grow through primarily through expansion and, and cobble together acquisitions that involve platforms, cloud technology, and applications? That didn't make it into an application guideline. I think we're really running the risk here when the when the courts get their hands on these guidelines and they're dealing with cases, they're, they're gonna be saying, okay, these are all the theories of harm and here are the applications that we could apply the theories of harm in. But by the way, that's not an exhaustive list of applications. A lot was missed in the process of putting those together. My, our suggestion was that this, these, do, these applications do not rise to the level of a guideline. They should have been included as narrative to support uh, the theories, the theories of, of harm. And I think, you know, we, we may well see um, uh, some of that developing and, and find, you know, to be honest, a lot of those applications guidelines are really the pet theories of the Biden enforcers and FTC versus anesthesia partners. That's the serial acquisition guideline. Um, the late, the uh, input markets guideline, that's Penguin Simon Schuster. By the way, we don't hear anything about all merge, a lot other mergers involving other types of input suppliers. Um, United Healthcare, United Healthcare Change, that's the multi sided mar market guideline. So, um, you know, I think it behooves the agencies to have been more expansive in their thinking about, um, you know, these various applications they were, were, were putting up in the guidelines for uh, the public to think about, the business community, the courts. And so I'm, we're going to be watching that very carefully moving forward. Thanks, Diane. I think that's a great way to end. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot in the guidelines. Um, warts and all, maybe some good things, but also there's a lot that's not there. And we're just going to have to see how it plays out in practice. So um, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, you know, for taking the time here and everyone for listening to this really excellent panel. And, um, you know, please do uh, follow ITIF on Twitter, on our website. We've got a lot um, going on this year on all things antitrust and tech policy. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a good one.